live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? Once again, I welcome you to another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on Twitter at Scott McKay on Parlor. Real Scott McKay on Instagram. You can find me on YouTube at Scott McKay. And also, the website is mountaintoppodcast.com and the Facebook group is the Mountaintop Summit. With me today are two new friends of mine. They're a whole lot of fun. They're insanely intelligent and we just love smart people around here, as you know. You guys love smart people around here because you guys are generally smart people yourselves. They are the authors of a trilogy of books that are called Pragmatist's Guides. And we are probably going to talk mostly today about their Pragmatist Guide to Relationships, although they have one on sex and one on life in general. Their names are Malcolm and Simone Collins, and I welcome them to the show. Welcome, y'all. Hi. It is so wonderful to be joining you today. Yeah, you have no idea. If you were here, I'd actually (laughs) feed you, which would be even better. Oh, my gosh. Making us salivate here. Well, now you guys are world travelers like we are. So you've been to Peru, which is famous for their food. As a matter of fact, you guys had an office in Peru, right? Yes. And and, and a house out there and it, getting to gorge ourselves on that cheap luxury food. We love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't even get me started. We'll turn this into a foodie episode, which is going <laughs> to not be what we're all here for. Now, I have to tell you, and in case guys are new to this show. You two are rather like peas in a pod, like Emily and I are. You obviously are as close to perfect for each other as can be and get along wonderfully. So I'm anticipating a lot of fun and, oh, you know what, not a whole lot of turbulence. So this should be great. We're excited. You can always refer to us as Malmoan. And we'll try not to screw this up. <laughs> Malmoan. Malmoan. I guess that uh, kind of flows off the lips better than silkum. Yeah, exactly. Oh. We, we, you know, we did workshop it for a while. Right. Well, you could be Simalco too. Simalco, hmm, little bouncy. I like it. Alien race. <laughs> yeah. That brings in the surname there. Sounds a little bit like a fueling station, but hey, that has the charm. <laughs> 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 now, listen, guys. We talked for darn near an hour, and time flew. And I'm sure that a lot of it will. I'm sure that the time will pass equally quickly on this show. And it took ages for us to arrive at one topic we could focus on because we were going in so many different directions at warp speed. But we decided on the rather illustrious concept of why dating is like fishing. And you all have this concept in your book on relationships about lures that we use in dating and relationships, which is a lot like trying to catch fish, hence the title of the episode. Talk to me about the lures and what goes on there. So I often talk to people who are you know, starting out with the dating game and they'll say, all women seem to act within this very specific pattern of interaction. And I've always likened it to talking to a fisherman and he's like, all fish have whiskers, don't you know that? And you say, well, you're using a catfish lure So of course all the fish you're catching have whiskers. A lure is fundamentally the value proposition you're providing because in the dating market, we're all products. And if you overemphasize one aspect of the value proposition, that can heavily color your relationship moving forward. Now we've got two people here, gentlemen, who are (laughs) serial entrepreneurs with lots of alphabet soup by their name and a heavy amount of education who have bought and sold companies. And so I'm not surprised, Samalco, <laughs> that <laughs> this is starting to sound a lot like dating is very similar to sales. That kind oh of Oh my gosh. Idea. Here's the crazy thing is, I mean, we did heavy dating campaigns, each of us, way before we ever got into sales or trying to acquire companies. And we basically just repurposed all of our dating strategy, including the scoring systems and the the high throughput systems. And the CRMs and the emails and everything. for 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 sales. So the funny thing is I feel like actually honing in your dating game really well makes you really, it's the best school to become a CEO. And you used to be in sales too, right? Me personally? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, big time. You get it. (laughs) Sure. 
Absolutely. And, you know, you have a product and you're marketing it. And there's a difference yeah. between marketing and sales, however. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, and as you know from sales, if you're trying to sell something to somebody, um, the the feature of it that you emphasize in your sales call is going to heavily influence the things that the customer ends up complaining about eventually. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why you talk about benefits, not features. <laughs> <laughs> ha, caught you. Touche. Touche. <laughs> All right. So anyway, back to what's important here. If we're in sales, the number one rule of getting a good sales job, and any of you guys who are young bucks out there who want to get into sales and make lots of money, never, ever, ever forget what I'm about to tell you. It's going to be a major takeaway, all right? The number one rule of getting a sales job is sell something that people actually want. If you're getting, <laughs> if you're getting roped into a sales job with a company who hasn't sold anything yet, and you can't even figure out the value of what they're trying to sell, I don't care if they're giving you a six-figure base. Run away. Run away, okay? Monty Python style. <laughs> if you're a car salesman, you do not want to be selling Mitsubishis in North America right now because nobody even realizes they're still in the market. What you want to be selling is like Audis where there's a waiting list, okay? Because you're helping people mm -hmm. buy what they already want. It's easy. If you're trying to force people or trick people into buying something they don't even freaking care about, you're going to be a very poor, starving salesperson because you're going to be pushing and pushing, getting desperate and more needy. And voila, you're going to start looking like desperate, needy, single guys who are trying to trick women into bed. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. So as I've always said, improve yourself as a man, be more masculine, be more attractive. Then you have a product, which in this case is ourselves, right? That is going to be more palatable to women and which is going to be more in demand, be the man in demand as it were. So I'm on the right track there, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as you're saying, you can always either improve the product or improve your ability to sell. Yeah. And we, we also make the point in our book about love, for example, that, that exactly follows what you just said, where a lot of people think, well, but I love you. And, you know, so why, why don't, you know, I love you more than he does. I love you more than she does. And so, like, as in, therefore you should want to be with me. Whereas the, the, the sort of funny thing is no one really cares about I that. Saying, I masturbate to you at home. You know, you're <laughs> not providing them something of value to them. Yeah. So it's, you know, it seems inherently people think that because it feels so strong to you that it's valuable to someone else when it's not. So to your point, knowing your market and what that market wants is so important. Wow, that's a fascinating concept because there's this stereotype of a woman who's just flat out not attractive enough to her boyfriend saying to him, if you break up with me, you're not going to know what you're missing out on. I'm the best woman you're ever going to get, and you're never going to replace me. Well, it's great that she feels like that, but until he feels like that, it's irrelevant, flatly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, oh no gosh. question. Man, there's a lot of guys out there going, wow, you just let me off the hook. For every bit of brow beating by an unattractive girlfriend I'm ever going to get for the rest of my life. Thanks, guys. You know, the guys are already saying that. But listen, we should never get ourselves in that position to begin with. It's kind of along the same lines of well, you should love me for who I am inside, not my outward mm. appearance. And then you marry her. And every time your head swivels around at the shopping mall, you get a rolling pin upside the head because she still wants to be this beautiful princess to you. The irony is she probably would have been more of that for another guy had she not pushed you into buying something you didn't want, which was a sleazy, pushy sales tactic. Mm. So ladies out there shouldn't act like they're trying to push timeshares on guys because all they're going to end up with is buyer's remorse. Instead, we should all just be more attractive because if it becomes this transaction of I think you need me, therefore, I'm going to pressure you into needing me. We've all kind of missed the point, haven't we? I was going to add to, to what you were saying is one thing when you when you view a, a relationship or dating is like sales. You know, as you say, one thing that's really important is you're selling a good product and you're actually featuring the, the, the features of the product, which are important. But uh, uh, something that is really important to keep in mind, and this is one place where the traditional uh, market of dating advice or when people are first learning to date, they often run into problems, is there is an easy strategy early in dating, which is to just be really arousing 
to your target. And with females, that often means that you want to act masculine, uh, dominant, and there's many ways that uh, people in the dating world help you achieve that. And that is really great for achieving early success in the market because you are giving the person a genuinely valuable thing that they genuinely want. But that thing that they want is on one market, which is the sex and dating market, is not necessarily the highest priority for them in a long-term relationship market. And so if you've sold them that as your primary value, uh, the same way like if you sell a car and instead of focusing on the mileage or how reliable it is, you focus on how in style it is this year, that car is going to get traded in in three or four years because it's not something that's valuable for them in the long term. And so combining that with other things of value is really critical. Fascinating. See, what you're talking about is selling people on what they want and <laughs> delivering them what they need. Sell the sizzle, not the steak, but the steaks, what they're physically going to eat for dinner. So, yeah. okay. First time I saw my wife, I was smitten. I wanted a piece of that ass so bad. Oh man. She was just everything <laughs> I'm attracted to. Fortunately for me, she turned out to be incredibly sane, had a sweet, wonderful heart, <laughs> was giving, wasn't a gold digger, and believed the same exact way I do on most everything. Wow, what incredible value. What amazing hidden bonuses that weren't part of the initial sales process. I mean, she had me as soon as she flashed that winning smile and looked all cute. I mean, I was probably living in a world steeped in confirmation bias, probably nothing. Okay. I was steeped in a world of confirmation bias from the moment I met her. I mean, I really wanted this to work, mm -hmm. but being a mature sort, I wasn't going to marry her going, ah, eh, well, you know what? She's batshit crazy. And she's already cheated on 10 guys. And you know, <laughs> she's got a heroin addiction, but boy, is that a nice piece of ass? You know, I'm not young, dumb, and full of cum enough to fall for that. But it sure was a nice stack of benefits for her to be so wonderful above and beyond what the initial sales pitch was, right? Yeah. And so that worked perfectly for you. But she could have presented you as a different sales pitch that may have, like, look at how eminently sane I am. I absolutely love that way of describing as, as a strong value proposition because in a partner, an eminent level of sanity is actually a really core part of a value pitch for a lot of people, especially if they've been in a bad relationship in the past. And sometimes you can start with selling that. You don't need to start with selling the arousal. Well, I think when you look at platforms like eHarmony and Match.com, that's the kind of lore. And, and we talk about it in terms of the quote unquote long-term relationship lore in which everyone's kind of working on the same assumption that, hey, we're all in this to form stable long-term relationships, probably start a family. Like that's what we're in this for. And we're all, you know, we have our lives together. And that is very attractive to a lot of people, depending on the stage in life that they're at. Uh, and it's it's really important that people don't mismatch those things, because what we also see a lot is there are women who want a long term relationship. But the lore that they're using is more like, oh, I'm really sexy. I'm really attractive. And then they get a bunch of guys who aren't necessarily looking for a long term relationship and they don't get that long term relationship. So. It's, it's super important to know what you want and also who you're trying to fish And to for. add to that, each of these value propositions is something you exercise. If you exercise your masculinity over and over and over again, you can end up with one of those guys who's like only exercising one muscle group. And then you enter a relationship and you're not able to provide these other areas of value sufficiently, which can cause conflict. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of a time I took a sales rep from the product house in to meet a school district. And her product was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And she was a rather newbie at this. And she talked about increasing the bottom line and how much their ROI was going to be and how much it would increase their income. And I had to raise my hand from the back of the room and go, um, this is a public sector customer. <laughs> Because, you know, my customers who I knew for a while were looking at the back of the room, giving me the help me eyes. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop. I got places to be. But she was a one trick pony. She only knew how to talk about her product vis-a-vis -vis how much money it was going to make the prospect. Mm -hmm. And she was totally derailed. She had nothing else to go on. So, yeah, if you see yourself as a one trick pony from the value perspective, a, you better make sure that's the value you want your target or prospect, as it were, mm -hmm. to buy. So indeed, 
there are a whole lot yeah. of women out there going, I better look sexy and better have nice cleavage and show bikini pictures here or no men are going to want me. Well, men are going to want to buy the product you're selling. So don't bitch and complain to me when men only quote unquote want one thing. That's your problem, honey, not his. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Oh my God. I love the way you phrase that. Hold on. Let, let, me, let me go ahead and be fair here because I'm equal opportunity. All y'all yeah. guys oh. listening out there who are standing next to your boat talking about how much money you made when you sold your last business, don't bitch and complain to me when you attract a bunch of gold diggers. Because uh, that's who you're bitching to. So true. <laughs> and, and one of the value props that is just so, so critical to really focus on, and, and this comes back to one of the things we say about marriage, is when you're choosing who you marry, the most important question isn't necessarily who they are, but who they want you to become and their capability to make you to become that person. Because everyone is influenced by the people we surround ourselves with. Mm -hmm. a, a, your friend group, everything like that, you know, that's why falling into a bad crowd means something. Your long-term partner will transform you. And if they have a vision for how you're going to transform over time, and they're good at helping you along that pathway, they can transform you into somebody imminently better, more who you want to be as a person, and you've had other guests on that talk about, you know, you can change who you are over time, especially with the help of a partner. And, and, and that aspect of the lure, you know, early in a relationship, showing your partner that you can help them improve themselves. When you have a partner who gets really excited about that, that's a great partner. And I always think that that's one of the value propositions that people should get really, really good at playing up. Well, and that's, that's specifically why we say that because that's what really kindled our relationship is um, I met Malcolm and we had such a weird first date because he was just like crazy honest with me in a way that guys never were. He was like, well, I'm not really looking to date. I'm looking to get married. And I expect to find my wife this fall at Stanford because there's a large pool of pre-vetted candidates there. And I'm like, whoa, okay. Like <laughs> most guys don't even want to say they want to sleep with me on our first date. And like, here's this guy who's like already told me he wants to get married and he's probably not likely to stay with me anyway. But what ultimately I, I just, first I wanted to be him because I wanted to be like the person I dreamed of being was brutally honest, was driven and ambitious like that. And, and unapologetic in their beliefs and goals. And what Malcolm ultimately proposed to me sort of in, in our early relationship that I found to be so alluring is he's like, okay, tell me all about your values, telling me about your life goals, telling me about who you really wish that you were. All right, well, how can we make a, let's make a game plan. Like, let's figure out how to make you this person you want to be with the expectation that we weren't going to be together forever. Cause I, for other reasons, insisted that we have a breakup date. And so I, I <laughs> was given this, this, proposition from someone of like, oh, I will turn you into whoever you wanted to be most and I'll help you get there and we'll workshop this together. And, and I became that person, which was amazing. And then, I mean, it sort of turned around as time went on in our relationship and Malcolm was like, well, here are things that I want to do and get better at. And I'm like, all right, well, let's work on it. And so we've just sort of been like climbing up on each other um, to like get up this huge mountain face. It's like we've climbed half dome together and we could never have done it because each time we're like climbing up each other's shoulders and then getting a new hold point and then the next person climbs up. And it's just incredible when a relationship can be used for that. You know, it's so much more than just being happy, being comfortable, starting a family. It's hard to get into that if, 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 you know, if you're a girl and the way you attracted the guy was by dressing very provocatively and, and, uh, yeah, or just, you know, just, on. just selling sex appeal. Yeah, um, selling it, sex it's appeal. harder to do that. Yeah, for sure. To quote an infamous street harassment video, the woman says, just because I dress provocatively doesn't mean I deserve to be provoked. <laughs> <laughs> Completely <laughs> naively oblivious to the fact that those are the same root word. All right. Anyway, I want this to be a minor tangent, but these guys are going to come with torches and pitchforks if you don't explain the breakup deadline. Oh dear. Okay. Oh, okay. So no, no, I've got to quickly. Well, you can say it. She basically said to me, it was like the scene in team America where I was like, look, I'm looking for a wife. And she goes, well, Malcolm, I want to sleep with you, but I will only do it if you promise to break up with me in four months. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Done. <laughs> but why, why four months? Why the deadline? <laughs> So I, uh, I, I had turned 24 and I had everything else in my life and, and I'm a very, um, I like being alone. I love being alone. And I, 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 I have, I struggle with humanity my, myself and other people. So my whole thing was I wanted to 
fall in love and have my heart broken in one year, just get it out of the way. So I could say that I'd experienced it and it was underwhelming and everyone else is disgusting. You never had sex before. You never, yeah, I never before. so I needed to be able to, cause people would like be like, well, you don't know what it's like, you don't understand. And so I had to do it. So Malcolm, I you dog. <laughs> Malcolm and um so I I had this whole campaign and I was like and so and and Malcolm was perfect right because he told me he was gonna he wanted to get married he wanted to get married to someone who was far more qualified than than myself and so I I knew he would be perfect because I was also gonna I totally was gonna fall for him and you were just looking to complete this campaign she had like this point system against people at her office that she created to motivate herself yeah for competitive dating because it's hard to date and I I didn't want to do it I just needed to get it out of the way so Malcolm was just my perfect like he would be that whole experience. And then I, but I knew that I'd get attached to him. So I needed to make him promise to like, to, you know, really end the relationship so that I wouldn't end up. Well, then know, there's the whole danger of love because you, you begin to feel emotions towards people and it, 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 it corrupts your judgment. Yeah. And so I wanted to make sure that I had controls in place to ensure that I, I didn't stay attached to him and then, you know, end up where we are now in in this horrible, horrible hell that is marriage and not living alone as I had so desperately desired. You've ruined everything, Malcolm. I I think the subtitle to this show just became when two extremely high IQ people finally find each other. (laughs) (laughs) Now here's what's fascinating to me. Simone, you're one of those blessed people who is extremely outgoing yet amazingly introverted people think we don't exist people can't wrap their head around us <laughs> well i i use it i think there's a very big misunderstanding of introversion though i think it's more 100 oh, percent, like, yes because it's what i describe it as this um an introverted person socializing is like playing soccer or swimming or insert your favorite sport you love it you you can do it for hours and you but then you're freaking exhausted yeah well, you're energized by the solitude. As yeah, you need, to, you need to freaking rest. Whereas like, I think for extroverts, it's not that extroverts like love people inherently more or are better at socializing. It's, it's is... that, yeah, that for them, socialization is air. You know, they, they need it to survive. Um, they will, they will, you know, completely flounder without it. So I you've loved COVID. You haven't left the house. Oh my gosh. This is my thing. You guys <laughs> like, Oh, is, is COVID your fetish? <laughs> yeah, this is my fetish. We're pandemics oh oh my gosh yes oh i'm i'm beyond happy you have no idea oh yeah we have talked about covid19 as being introvert paradise before (laughs) all right so uh samalco or (laughs) mousico samalco let's go back in time a couple minutes you're talking about this idea of finding someone just to kind of put it into a baseline perspective who voila, you actually freaking get along with. Okay, guys, if you ride motorcycles, how about not marrying a woman who thinks they should be called murder cycles and is going to demand you sell all the motorcycles as soon as you get married? (laughs) Why not instead marry a woman who whacks your helmet and says, is that all this thing can do? Let's go faster. That's your honey. Mm -hmm. At least till the kids are born. Then you'll probably sell your own motorcycles. Oh my gosh, I love that. And in the same vein... Don't marry somebody who likes something about you that you had intended on being temporary until you got married. So if you're spending a ton of time at the gym, like suppose you're a girl, you're spending a ton of time at the gym, getting to look really hot. That's your value proposition. Don't drop that after the marriage. That's why they're with you. Or for another example, I really can't stand my parents right now. You know, because I'm in my early 20s angst. Oh, me either. I hate my parents. Great. Let's get married and make babies. And then you reconcile with your parents a year later because you realize it was all your immaturity. And (laughs) why did we bond over something so ridiculous? Right. Well, here's here's what I'm telling guys relative to the Match.coms and eHarmonies of the world. By the way, I don't recommend eHarmony. I don't believe in arranged marriage, which is why. Among other crazy reasons why OkCupid needs to be stricken. They took away the search feature. They are now literally giving you who you need to be attracted to. And considering where they're coming from politically, I think that sounds, well, fascist, okay? But here's what I'm telling guys. A year and a half ago, and this is not news to these guys on the show. I'm repeating this so you can riff on it your way. For years, I believe that if you're artificially limiting your dating pool, You're making a mistake. Like, unless you campaign for one side or the other, please put middle of the road politically, okay? Things like that. Now, I'm taking the exact opposite tack. 
there are so many people out there just collecting likes without any real intention of meeting each other that I'm telling people to be ruthless. I'm saying, look, if you're a Trump supporting gun toting gas hog driving meat eating reformed felon who wants to go out and commit more crime, go find your partner. Tell her who she is. The problem is people are so afraid of rejection and hate and disapproval by people they're not even attracted to that they're reticent to do that. But my question to anyone, regardless of who it is and who they're looking for, I mean, they may be the exact opposite person I described, of course, or somewhere in between, right? If you were looking for someone whose idea of a vacation is going to North Korea, not going on Royal Caribbean, say so. Go find the people who are like you and a pox on the people who aren't. Because if you get five of them, you're great. Why are you going after a million people who are lumped into the same box as the other generic millions who are trying to somehow secure a date with a bunch of people who are exactly like them, like a bunch of sheeple, when you could say to five specific women, perhaps, who are out there, hey, you're one of me. You and I belong together. Because all five of those women are going to go, oh, my goodness, look at this. This guy's one of me. Then all of a sudden you may have a real actual relationship that's built on something other than some superficiality. I 100% agree. I mean, so it's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword though, because we still really, really believe in high throughput methods. Cause I mean, that's, that's just how you're going to get what you want. It's a numbers game, but also editing things out is so important. And Malcolm did that like well, since you were, well, I was really, so, so I think if you're just looking for sex, uh -huh. don't, artificially limit people. I mean, you want to just about high throughput or if you're just about practicing dating or just about getting girls and you're early into dating, like especially when you're younger, don't artificially limit people. When you get to the stage where you're looking for a wife, artificially limit like crazy because yes, you're going to have a lower success rate with every individual person, but you're not going to waste all of that time on those three or four months relationships before you realize you're incompatible. And that's what really screws people up when they're looking for a long-term partner is all of the time they waste in those four or five months relationships uh, when they could have just found out by, by limiting that person up front. And they're like, yeah, but it dramatically lowers my success rate. And it's like, it's not lowering your success rate. It's just keeping you from getting these sort of panaceas of success, these fake successes that feel like they're being successful, but they're just eating your time. Yeah, that's well, hold on, well, hold on a second, better. hold on a second. Simone, I want to hear your take, but something very important just happened in this last interaction. Malcolm, you said that you still believe in a high throughput method if you're just trying to get laid. Well, how is a person going to establish their unique sales prop, right? Here we go again. Mm -hmm. Even to the people they want to just have sex with when there are still that same million people out there competing on a level of superficiality with each other. How do you know? Is it just you're going to have to be the beautiful person in the beautiful picture because everybody's faking their pictures nowadays too. How do you change, differentiate in that environment? Change your sale prop based on the target. Uh, back when I was just, you know, the sleeping with people, I looked at someone, I'd be like, ah, she's got like a hippie style. You know, I talked to her enough to understand her values on things. And I present a package that somebody like that's going to want to buy. And, you know, they, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. They get excited about this package, but if you optimize a package, that's not who you want to be permanently. Like, if, and this is where this whole concept of maintaining frame comes in, is guys find this product that sells really well, and then they just have to fake who they are to stay that package so they can keep their partner, which is insane. But it makes sense if you're just, you know, if I'm dating a goth girl, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm super into vampire role play, you know? Um, because that's the package she wants. Isn't that dishonest though? I think that everyone has many facets of who they are. When a person is maintaining frame or something like that, they're often tapping into an aspect of, of who they are and what they believe and things they find fun. It's just not an aspect of who they are that they want to maintain 24 seven for the rest of their life. Um, and we all have many facets of who we are and the facet you show to somebody can be, uh, and it always is to some extent, always is to some extent curated for that person. But once you marry someone, that facet of who you are becomes who you are permanently. And that facet of who you are is the one that's, that's cut and hewn and made better. Understood. Okay. So if I'm just playing the field, I may be in the mood for a certain type yeah. of person. It's okay for me to play up to that type I'm in the mood for, to that type of person, knowing it's not going to be permanent by design. 
Well, maybe maybe I'm just uh, lying to myself to uh, justify my unethical actions. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm on board with what you're saying now. I did that in my dating life, too. I'm like, oh, there's a cute little redhead who seems really spunky and has a little naughty streak in her. I haven't dated one of those in a long time. She seems like fun. I'm going to play up to that, which isn't yeah. dishonest. It's just one unique facet. I have other types of women who I genuinely like also. Exactly. Yeah. I think that the only, the line to walk is to not end up using what we've, we've come to call the sneaky lore in which you really do pretend to be something that you're not to integrate yourself with a group, to try to get people within that group, sort of trying to secure them in ways that they would disagree with. Well, I guess this is the guy who pretends to be a feminist to pick up chicks. Yeah. You know, like he isn't kind of actually thing. a feminist, but uh, you know, it, it, as to what you're saying, like the, the redhead girl that you're talking about, I mean, one thing to be really careful about, and this is something that I suffered with when I was first learning to date, is I optimized around the types of girls that I found I could get to sleep with me the easiest that I found the most physically attractive. And so I was honing a character that wasn't who I actually wanted to be permanently, but it was the character that I was having the most luck with. And I think that a lot of guys accidentally find themselves going down that road when they first are learning sort of to date in the, in the game around dating. You know, I'm reminded of an evolutionary psych or evolutionary biology. Sometimes I can't tell the difference concept that scholars in that field talk about, which is perhaps inauspiciously called sneaky fuckers. And that's the term. Yeah, yeah, sneaky that's where we took it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go explain it. I'm excited. Okay. So <laughs> It sounds like you're familiar with the term. And to be honest, I've been looking to do a whole show on that very concept uniquely for over a year now and haven't found the right expert who can talk about it as glibly as I want them to. I can quickly go into it. So if you're talking about like the Western brass or something, fish or something like that, there's a lot of fish and animals that do this. And it's really interesting. So whenever you have an animal where the uh, or not whenever, but sometimes when you have an animal where males and females look very different. Um, you will get this alternate strategy. So you'll have one strategy. Well, hold on a second. Control. There's an important part there before you get to the alternate okay. strategy. Sorry to interrupt you because my audience doesn't like when I do that. But we're talking about species where there's heavy competition for the right to mate. Yes. And the alpha males of the species get to have sex, even though all the males are left horny. Yes. Rather kind of like elephants or lions or <clears throat> human beings. <laughs> yes. Continue. So in extreme examples of one of these species, like if we're talking about extreme example, we can talk about a type of crab or a fish. The male will be like three times as big as the female. It'll look entirely different from the female and it will compete based on its, its size and dominance in for females. And it'll have like a harem of females. But then there's this other type of male that actually like fundamentally changes its development in, in extreme cases. Now you get sneaky copulation in social species as well, where you don't see them change their morphology, but in extreme examples, they'll change their morphology and some males will develop to essentially look like a female. They'll be small like a female. In all other respects, they'll appear to be female, except they'll have male reproductive organs and they sneak into the harem of these larger males and they'll sneakily copulate with, um, I think in, in humans, we call that rape, but, <laughs> but they'll sneak well, yeah. copulate with lots of these females. What I often wonder. Or we used to call it gay game during PUA days. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wonder if it's why rape Google that one, yeah. is so high in feminist circles. I've, I've often wondered that because you get these really crazy high, you know, uh, who do surveys in their own communities of rape within those communities. And it could be a different definition of what rape is, all sorts of things to contribute to it. But I wonder if a part of it is that those communities, these female only spaces or these ideological hegemony spaces act as sort of flags for guys who have subconsciously sort of adopted these sneaky strategies. Oh, I think all of these guys who agree that the future is female and wear pussy hats to fourth wave feminist rallies and denigrate their own gender think they're trying to get laid by infiltration and they're not. And they wonder how that can possibly have been the case. <laughs> they did everything they were asked to do and told to do yet. The women are going, eh, I don't know, maybe not. Well, and imagine that frustration. I mean, we also talk about that oh, yeah. in terms of, of just general niceness. So not even about subculture or ideology infiltration, but just, you know, the concept of, oh, if you're nice, then people will be, 
you know, more receptive to you, which is not, well, it's sort of nonsense. But, well, and it's not that those strategies never work. Yeah. But right. here's what happens in those groups. The one male within those groups is typically, or a group of males within those groups is typically the hot dog males, you know, the king of the crop of that group, the true alphas of those groups. The real chum in a world of rubber plastic lures. <laughs> yes. And since those, those groups are typically polyamorous and all the women are polyamorous, all of them sort to the same few males, which causes additional frustration. And what a lot of people do when their strategies aren't working or their sneaky copulation strategies aren't working is they double down on those strategies. And that's where you get this really aggressive submission, I guess is the only way I can, I can describe it. And, and men believe that if they just double down and double down and double down, it will work when they don't realize that everyone in those communities is sorting to the same guys. Mm. Well, you basically just summed up the whole pickup artist movement. Mm. Here's how we trick women who don't like you into liking us. And if it doesn't mm. work, do twice as much of it. And <laughs> when what yeah. works really is counterintuitive, which is being yeah. attractive, which often is yeah. what guys expect back to the dominance routine. But as far as sneaky fuckers, I mean, you guys are so smart. Your brains move faster than your mouth does. And I completely relate to that, <laughs> uh, which is why this is such an amazingly high powered garrulous episode. These guys are going to be left with a splitting headache just out of pure length of engagement. They've had to keep their brain cells firing, um, which is beautiful. I love it personally, but at the risk of exhausting my entire audience, as it relates to being a sneaky fucker, you were talking about kind of modifying, you know, morphing into what you need to be as opposed to who you need to be to attract the kind of woman you're looking for, which is why the concept of sneaky fuckers triggered with me to begin with, because mm -hmm. that to me is how they typically talk about the human representation of what often in, you know, well, you were talking about invertebrates, but even in mammalian circles, you know, the beta lions still get lucky sometimes by virtue of tricking the alpha lion away or, you know, what yeah. we commonly called rape or some way of being sneaky rather than straightforward, which to me is the sign of not being a truly attractive male vis-a-vis -vis the more attractive males who are going to attract women with a lot more facility. So I want to clarify for these guys that what you're talking about is rather more like what I mentioned earlier, which is I'm in the mood for this. So I'm going to talk to this woman in a way she can relate because I'm multifaceted and I'm rather a jack of all trades rather than I'm simply sneaky and trying to deceive her in some way. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I love how you answered first, Simone. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'd love to expand on a concept you touched on there, which sure. is the difference between the way alphas actually act in social species and the way that there's sort of the perception of how alphas act. And this concept of a, of a Chad that people talk about, you know, sort of this loner guy who's popular within a group of other men and who's ultra masculine. They're really describing something that's known in, in animals as a roaming bachelor group. Um, and a roaming bachelor group are actually males that have been rejected by the group as a whole, find solace in other males. And sometimes they breed by like raiding tribes and like forcibly breeding with the women. But their gen is generally an unsuccessful strategy. The alphas of groups, you know, I say they're not the Chad, they're the astronaut Mike Dexters. They are the guy who the other guys want to be like. Um, and, and when they sleep with these other guys' girls, the other guys are typically like, Oh yeah. I won't say like, I get it, but like, yeah, he's such a cool guy. I almost can't be mad at him. Those are like the true, true alphas within, within the primate species. And a lot of these submissive strategies that guys choose is they're trying to butter up these true alphas to get the cast offs of the true alphas. Yeah, because I, I th also think that like Chad sets up other guys with girls. Like Chad is a well, team player. The, the Mike Dexter does. Oh, yeah, sorry. The yeah, Mike Dexter. Dexter. The Chad doesn't. The no, Chad, Chad doesn't. doesn't. But the problem yeah, he's, with he's well fed, right? right? Is, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. we're moving more and more towards open relationships. And so the problem you get is when the astronaut Mike Dexter doesn't need to, you know, doesn't have a, a certain amount of women where he gets his fill, he's not going the you know he's not going to give them to these supplicant guys um and it's caused a breakdown of specific dating pools which you see was like the genie coefficient on tinder with all of the women going to the same few guys with the same what is it like two percent right now like they, they say right now if you look at the genie coefficient on tinder it's um the the, the average guy on tinder is liked by less than two percent of women so the, the genie coefficient being a measure of economic inequality this is all very fascinating and I'll tell you why in a nutshell. 
the idea here at play is who you're referring to as the alpha, which is the mm -hmm. guy who gets to breed with who he chooses to breed with is not trying very hard. He simply is, he's not doing he's being. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. there is a cadre of men who are very happy to be sneaky fuckers. They're very happy to be this group of wandering males trying to get some. And I think you just summed up the difference between the pickup artist movement and what we do around here. I do not mm -hmm. coach sneaky fuckers. Mm -hmm. I coach guys to become the alpha of this entire pack. In other words, exactly. I want yeah. guys to be able to choose who they want. And if they're getting well fed, hey, you know, she has a friend. You want me to set you up on a double date? The guy's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I need some. All right. Well, you know, keep it in the holster a little and act like a human being when we're together. And maybe I'll make <laughs> it happen for you. But, you know, if he's ending yeah. a dry spell, the next two or three who come along, he's going to keep them for himself, too. But he's the chooser, not the chaser, which is an ongoing theme around here. Nice. Totally. Yes. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And if I was going to add any nuance to that, I would say that the supplicants and the sneaky guys are two alternate strategies. The sneaky guy strategy is where you pretend to be a female to gain access to female spaces or pretend to believe things you don't believe to gain access to those spaces. The Mr. supplicant nice strategy... Guy. Yeah, yeah, it's where you find somebody who's like a pickup artist guru and you basically worship at his feet all the time, but you're like the king of the people who worship at his feet. You're his his Mr. Smith. What is it? Mr. Smithers. What is he like? Mr. Burns or whatever? Uh, no, Mr. Smithers. <laughs> they, Mr. You're Smithers, the Mr. Yeah. Burns to his Mr. Smithers. Yes. You know, you, you may be a supplicant, but you're the king supplicant. And you see this with all these guys, you know, who follow, uh, you know, these other communities. They go live in their houses even. And, and you'll see this and they... they it's weird, uh, oh, yeah. but it, oh, yeah. it does look very similar to um, the way uh, it works in chips, which is fascinating. Well, we're still disgusting humans, so. And oh, well. that's a great way to finish off this particular discussion. We're all still <laughs> disgusting humans. I just want to find someone who's disgusting in the same way I am and be thrilled with each other's disgustingness equally. It's beautiful. Cheers to that. Yeah. Cheers to that. It's now beer 30. And with that, I want to point you guys to these books by Mousico, Malcolm and Simone Collins. <laughs> and uh, the one we're talking about now mostly is Pragmatist Guide to Relationships. Although I think we've slipped into talking about the Pragmatist Guide to Sexuality also here, haven't we? Quite a bit. We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man. Go uh, score all of them. Go to my Amazon influencer page. By hitting up mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon and uh, rake them all into the barn. Or if that sounds a bit overwhelming to you, simply go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, and get your hands on the Pragmatist Guide to Relationships. Uh, because, you know, if we say Mousico or Simalco, it's just going to confuse people. Although, I, you know what? Just for the hell of it. I'm going to go ahead and make a front slash S-I-M-A-L-C-O just to see who goes there. <laughs> I'll be measuring. <laughs> nice. But uh, what a wonderful relationship. And one thing I didn't share with you until the very end is this is the first time ever I've had two guests on at the same time, especially a man and a woman. And it's been a lot of fun and it worked out pretty well. It's rather like, uh, well, I'm not going to go there, but I was going to say it's rather like having your first threesome and having it work much better than expected. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it ever does. Yeah. <laughs> well, it did in this case. So, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy. Miracle. Anyway, their names are Malcolm and Simone Collins, and they are a Jack and Jill of all trades and a master of many, actually. If you learn more about them, you'll find that uh, they're very, very interesting people. And we hope to do this again real soon. Would you guys come back? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Well, this threesome went really, really better than expected. <laughs> all right. <laughs> devil's threesome such that it was right malcolm oh All my right. god so anyway <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for being on in all seriousness it's been a great conversation what a pleasure all right gentlemen with that if you want to be one of these alpha dogs or alpha lions and not one of these sneaky fuckers what you need to do is go to mountaintoppodcast.com talk to me straight up 
for 25 minutes about where you are right now, where you want to be. You can do that by clicking the little red button in the upper right hand corner and get started. And we'll talk about a plan to take you from where you are right now to where you want to be. That's there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. Also visit our friends at origin in Maine. See what Jocko Willink and the guys have come up with. I'll tell you where I started was with those bison boots and also with the factory jeans, which are still the best jeans I've ever worn. Use the coupon code origin 10 when you go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash origin, and you'll be glad you did. And until I talk to you guys again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.